This is the story of a man named Stanley. Stanley worked for a company in a big building where he was employee number 427. Employee number 427's job was simple. He sat at his desk in room 427 and he pushed buttons on a keyboard. Orders came to him through a monitor on his desk, telling him what buttons to push, how long to push them, and in what order. This is what employee 427 did every day of every month of every year. And although others might have considered it soul rending, Stanley relished every moment that the orders came in, as though he had been made exactly for this job. And Stanley was happy. And then one day, something very peculiar happened. Something that would forever change Stanley. Something he would never quite forget. He had been at his desk for nearly an hour when he realized that not one single order had arrived on the monitor for him to follow. No one had showed up to give him instructions, call a meeting, or even say hi. Never in all his years at the company had this happened, this complete isolation. Something was very clearly wrong. Shocked, frozen solid, Stanley found himself unable to move for the longest time. But as he came to his wits and regained his senses, he got up from his desk and stepped out of his office. Even now, Stanley's office was a distant memory. What did it look like? There was a computer, perhaps, and a painting. Was it a painting or a photo? He could no longer recall. No matter how hard Stanley looked, he couldn't find a trace of his co-workers. Stanley went around touching every little thing in the office, but it didn't make a single difference, nor did it advance the story in any way. Stanley clicked on literally every single door in the office because he doesn't pick up well on cues from his environment. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. Perhaps he wanted to stop by the employee lounge first, just to admire it. Ah, yes, truly a room worth admiring. It had really been worth the detour after all, just to spend a few moments here in this immaculate, beautifully constructed room. Stanley simply stood here, drinking it all in. Yes, really, really worth it being here in the room. A room so utterly captivating that even though all your co-workers have mysteriously vanished, here you sit looking at these chairs and some paintings. Really worth it. But eager to get back to business, Stanley took the first open door on his left. Stanley was so bad at following directions, it's incredible he wasn't fired years ago.
Look, Stanley, I think perhaps we've gotten off on the wrong foot here. I'm not your enemy, really, I'm not. I realize that investing in your trust in someone else can be difficult, but the fact is that the story has been about nothing but you all this time. There's someone you've been neglecting, Stanley. Someone you've forgotten about. Please, stop trying to make every decision by yourself. Now, I'm not asking for me, I'm asking for her. This is it, Stanley. Your chance to redeem yourself. To put your work aside. To let her back into your life. She's been waiting. That's her, Stanley. You need to be the one to do this. To reach out to her. If you can truly place your faith in another, then pick up the phone. Oh, Stanley, is that you? Uh, hold on, sweetie. Sorry to keep you waiting. I'm just pulling the bread out of the oven. All right. Okay, there we go. All right, now, I want you to come in and tell me all about your day. <laughs> gotcha. Oh, come on. Did you actually think you had a loving wife? Who'd want to commit their life to you? I'm trying to make a point here, Stanley. I'm trying to get you to see something. Come inside. Let me show you what's really going on here. Sorry, but you're in my story now. This is a very sad story about the death of a man named Stanley. Stanley is quite a boring fellow. He has a job that demands nothing of him, and every button that he pushes is a reminder of the inconsequential nature of his existence. Look at him there, pushing buttons, doing exactly what he's told to do. Now he's pushing a button. Now he's eating lunch. Now he's going home. Now he's coming back to work. One might even feel sorry for him, except that he's chosen this life. But in his mind, ah, in his mind he can go on fantastic adventures. From behind his desk, Stanley dreamed of wild expeditions into the unknown, fantastic discoveries of new lands. It was wonderful, and each day that he returned to work was a reminder that none of it would ever happen to him. And so he began to fantasize about his own job. First he imagined that one day while at work, he stepped up from his desk to realize that all of his co-workers, his boss, Everyone in the building had suddenly vanished off the face of the earth. The thought excited him terribly. So he went further. He imagined that he came to two open doors and that he could go through either. At last, choice. It barely even mattered what lay behind each door. The mere thought that his decisions would mean something was almost too wonderful to, to behold. As he wandered through this fantasy world, he began to fill it with many possible paths and destinations. Down one path lay an enormous round room with monitors and mind controls. And down another was a yellow line that weaved in many directions. And down another was a game with a baby. 
and he called it the Stanley Parable. It was such a wonderful fantasy, and so in his head he relived it again, and then again, and again, over and over, wishing beyond hope that it would never end, that he might always feel this free. Surely there's an answer down some new path, mustn't there be? Perhaps if he played just one more time. But there is no answer. How could there possibly be? In reality, all he's doing is pushing the same buttons he always has. Nothing has changed. The longer he spends here, the more invested he gets, the more he forgets which life is the real one. And I'm trying to tell him this, that in this world he can never be anything but an observer, that as long as he remains here, he's slowly killing himself. But he won't listen to me. He won't stop. Here, watch this. Stanley, the next time the screen asks you to push a button, do not do it. You see? Can he just not hear me? How can I tell him in a way that he'll understand that every second he remains here, he's electing to kill himself? How can I get him to see what I see? How can I make him look at himself? I suppose I can't. Not in the way I want him to. But I don't make the rules. I simply play to my intended purpose, the same as Stanley. We're not so different, I suppose. I'll try once more to convey all this to him. I'm compelled to. I must. Perhaps, well, maybe this time he'll see. Maybe this time. And I tried again, and Stanley pushed a button. And I tried again, and Stanley pushed a button. And I tried...